a file you input data, LDPE, say this is normal data, and uh, we're going to we're going to use just the first few columns. Uh, so I'm not going to exclude them here though. You say okay, create that, finish up, save. So here's where we cre will create the two blocks. But we'll create new block, uh, zone one. And we're going to put into zone one that inlet temperature, the max, T max one, out one, TCN one. I can't, my keyboard doesn't allow me to control select. So I'm going to do them one at a time. So all the variables that end with the one are from zone one, as well as the pressure. So should have eight variables. Inlet temperature, pressure, as well as six others that end with the one. No representation? And we're, all, we're, not, we're not going to use these last five, five, five variables. Okay. Okay. So that's zone one. We're going to create a second block, zone two. That's also inlet temperature, uh, T max two, and out two. Location at the maximum Z2, flow rate of initiator 2, solvent flow rate 2, and pressure. So we've got our two blocks over there. Make sure you don't include that first block of the all 19 variables. So at the bottom here, it tells you this model is a multi block PCA on the X's. So we get that bit of feedback there from the software. It's detected that it's a multi block PCA. Uh, you, don't, you don't have to go adjust any of the scaling. This scaling here, if you want to drop down there or you change that number there. That's if you want to post inflate a certain block more than the other. But right now we, we don't. We just want to do a basic analysis of the data. Say okay. Um, so this is a, a multi-block PCA. And let's auto fit. So it's eight components by cross validation. So just as a bit of a background here, what the software's gone and done is there's eight variables in the first block, eight variables in the second block. It's gone and sent in and scaled those eight variables for each block, divide through by the square root of eight for block one, square root of eight for block two. It just happens that our blocks have equal number of variables in this example. Um, they, they could well have been different. And then it just builds a PCA on that combined 16 columns. The super scores from those 16 columns are what's shown when we plot T1 versus T2. Okay, so this is the ordinary score plot from that combined 16 column PCA, T1 versus T2. And so there's, there's nothing that we notice in that particular score plot at this point in time. So those are the super scores. We can go look at um, the block scores. So analyze, score plot, and then when you, in the drop down over here, you change to zone one for on the X axis, zone one on the Y axis for the component one versus component two, add that series, say okay. There's the T1 versus T2 for the first block. Okay, and remember I said that our choice of deflation uh, will induce orthogonality at the super level. We'll get orthogonal scores at the super level because of our choice of deflation. But at, this, at the block level, we won't get orthogonality. Our loadings and our scores are not necessarily orthogonal. But as we see here, they're almost orthogonal. There's some tilt here, but they, there's definitely, uh, they're, they're, they're not orthogonal P1 versus P2 at four block one. Again, though, here, in this particular score plot, nothing stands out. There's no outliers. You interpret this score plot from the, at the block level, no difference to the usual score plot. Go also take a look at the score plot for the second block, the second zone. And its tilt is in a slightly different direction. So there's only one observation that's outside the, of two observations that are outside the 95% limit over there. But again, nothing that I would go investigate. I'd also ask you to go take a look at the loadings for the block at the block level. So um, I'm going to actually look at the loadings by plot in this instance. Just so you can see the scores and the loadings for each block is superimposed. So the loadings by plot for block uh, zone one. 
was as follows. In this particular example, uh, we, we're just seeing here the blue triangles are the, are the 54 observations. But it's telling us in, in this, uh, if you look at the lower links, which are in black, we're seeing which other variables that are correlated with each other in that loading. So the outlet temperature, the inlet temperature of the coolant, the flow rate of the initiator, and the maximum temperature, those variables are positively correlated with each other. So the outlet temperature is going to be high if the flow rate of the initiator in is high. And that, map, that hot spot temperature is going to be at a higher value than average also when you're putting in more initiated but the flow of, uh, the flow rate of the initiate in is high. So those flows make sense. Um, they're negatively correlated with the hot spot location, Z1. So the hot spot moves, if, if the flow rate of the initiator increases, the Z1 value decreases. That implies, in other words, the hot spot moves closer to the front of the reactor. Z1 is a shorter distance from the inlet. So the flow rate of the initiator in is high, the, out, uh, the hot spot moves closer up to the front. Those variables are loaded in that direction. Orthogonal to that direction would be something along here, which is the pressure at zone one. So the pressure in zone one doesn't follow this relationship. It, it behaves independently of those variables. And in this particular variable, I'm not sure what it is over there, it's got a, a, a close to zero loading. So it's interpreted in the same way. It's not playing any role in these particular two. If we look at the loadings for the second zone, um, quick question. Yeah. Uh, you said that it has a zero loading. Uh, what does that mean? I guess no effects on. Yeah, it's not. It's not taking part in these two components. It's got zero loading, zero weight. So it's not an important variable from these first two components. Perspective. It may be important in the third and fourth components. So, uh, what two components? Or uh, what two components are you looking at then? I. T1 and T2 for the uh, first block for zone one. Okay. If we look at now at uh, T1, uh, sorry, P1 and P2, and T1 and T2 for the second zone, uh, set, uh, different variables this time, different orientation as well. Uh, the correlation though is similar. We're seeing the maximum temperature in zone two is also correlated with the flow rate of the initiated in zone two. The outlet temperature from zone two is correlated to those, and those are all negatively correlated to the inlet, uh, uh, sorry, to the Z2 position along the reactor. So that's similar interpretation of those variables as we saw in the first zone. The only one that's different here this time is that the pressure actually does seem to uh, play a role in the second component in that, in that direction. So maybe it's the way that the reactor is operating in the second zone that, that affects the temp, that affects the pressure, whereas the way the reactor behaves in the first zone has, has no bearing on the pressure. So whatever is affecting pressure yeah, is coming through in the second zone of the reactor rather than the first zone. So that's interesting to know. Also, the, the inlet temperature and the coolant temperature are uh, yeah, T in zone two, so they, these show a negative relationship. I think that's coincidental because these two are both manipulated variables. Unless they're being manipulated so that uh, they're they're going, uh, that they're oppositely correlated, but maybe that's, that's just a small correlation. Okay, so we can <coughs> safely interpret the loadings separately. If you do happen to plot P1, P2 over here, what this is showing you, remember, Consensus PCA is nothing more than PCA and all the data put together with careful scaling ahead of time. So this particular P1, P2 plot is that PCA model, that overall PCA model. So it's going to show all the variables from all the, all the blocks there in one go through. Finally, what's, what's quite interesting in this particular example are the square prediction errors. If I look at SPE for zone one, those are them over there. And apart from that one observation, there isn't uh, too much shell that I'm really interested in here. With this case study, remember, observations 51, 52, 53, and 54 were outliers. When we looked at the monitoring right back in the fourth or fifth class of this course, we used this case study. And those five, four observations were 
simulated outliers when this data set was generated. What's interesting to notice here is that they're not showing up in this particular SPE. So it's indicating that those four observations, which are known to be unusual, are not unusual from zone one's perspective. Okay, if we take a look, however, at zone two, they should show up over there. So square prediction error for zone two block. Okay, so not all four of them show up there, but certainly the last two of the four show up over there. So 50 observations, 53 and 54, stick out over here. Now, this is interesting from a monitoring perspective because it, it simplifies our monitoring problem. On a large complicated flow sheet, we can have multiple blocks and have a monitoring system, a monitoring SPE, one SPE chart for each block. Okay. And then when we see an alarm here on this SPE, we can go and interrogate it and get the contribution plot. Particular observation, we can go ask for contributions for that. And the contribution plot is only going to be for the eight variables that happen to be in this block. This is the key advantage of, of multi block PCA PLS. A contribution plot from a large model with many columns, let's say 200 columns from a petrochemical system, will throw up 200 bar plots, values on that contribution plot. But not all of them are, are necessarily going to be relevant, and not all of them are going to isolate the problem. Multi-block monitoring behaves as follows. You build an SPE uh, chart for each block, and then when you notice the SPE goes out of the limits for that block, you get the contribution plot for the variables in that block alone. And it isolates your modeling, your, your monitoring and fault detection to just those variables. There's no need now to go get contribution plots for the variables in blocks that show no SPE alarms. For example, I wouldn't go and do the contribution plot for block one in this example because the SPE for block one didn't alarm. Okay. So that paper by Joe Chin that I referenced right at the beginning of this section, they have a nice case study on a polyester extrusion line where they have exactly this. And he shows, uh, this is, was a case study from DuPont, they had a very crude, sorry, not a crude, but they had a PCA model monitoring that polyester line. And every time the operators would get a contribution plot, about 20 variables out of, of the 100 would show up with having large bars. And so the operators just ignored that monitoring system because they didn't know which of the 20 were really the cause of the problem. So this paper shows a breakdown where they take those 100 variables and they group them into several regions of the extrusion line. And once the contribution, uh, sorry, once the SP goes out of the limits for, let's say, region two and region three, they go get the contributions just for those regions so they localize their interpretation and they localize where to, die, uh, where to start fixing this polyester reactor. So that's a good paper to read. It's, a, it's an interesting case study that illustrates how monitoring works. In this, this case study, the LDP data case study, was used by Dr. McGregor in the ASCHE paper that I referenced earlier as well. So you can, you can go read both of those to see a bit more about multi-block monitoring. Any questions on this case study before we move on? Have you done the That's a good question, yeah. So now I was asking whether we can get by with totally independent models on, um, on the blocks. So build a PCA purely on, on this block or build a PCA just on this block. What happens in those cases is that there might be, um, let's see, what happens is if there's not, let's consider how can we look at it. We can look at two cases. One is where there's a fault in, in one block. And not in the other block. So what you should get then is a fault, your monitoring model on the first block showing up and the, the block without the fault should should should. What are we buy, what are we getting as an advantage by combining the two blocks in the case is, is what your question is asking, right? So where that comes from is if these two blocks are correlated, like if there's if there's some correlation between the variables in the two blocks 
in the sense that maybe these are two unit operations that are back to back in a larger flow sheet. So it's expected that the variables in the first block carry over to the second block. What that will get us is we're going to get these super scores, uh, sorry, the block scores from each block coming together here in the super block. Okay, and then when we monitor the SP and T squared at the super level, or we can monitor the SP and T squared at the block level, but let's, what, what will happen is if, if block one and block two have some correlation in, in common, they will, you'll get a, a T1 column here for the first block, a T2 column, a T1 column for the second block rather, and what will be interesting are those, the relative loadings here at the super level, which will tell you how much each block contributes to this consensus score. So I guess from a monitoring point of view, there's probably not a whole lot there, I think, other than, yeah, you could probably get by with the two separate monitoring models, because you're still gonna have to monitor as many plots as you do with the individual, uh, with the multi-block plot, right? So there's still two SP plots, still gonna get contributions of the same sort. The only time I can think that maybe it will help you out is if there's missing data in one block. So if there's missing data in one block, and but it's present in the other, yet there's a correlation between the two blocks. When you go through all of this, these arrows, those missing data will be imputed in this one block, come, will come through from the second block. So it, it will impute those missing values. That's probably the only advantage I think from a monitoring perspective. Though. Actually, there's also a strong argument to be made for the separate monitoring in the sense of model maintenance. Right? It's easier to maintain two separate models because if you want to update the model in the future, it's easy just to update one and then you don't have to touch the other one. So yeah, I guess there's advantages for the, for the multiple multiple PCA models. But maybe, I'm sure that there, there could other be other advantages on the multi-block, other than the, the something that will come from the from the joint correlation between the blocks. That's right? going to be an advantage. Yeah. I can't think of anything right now. So. Maybe also even for prediction, right? Uh, if from a, a multi-block PLS, which we're going to look at next, there, there's probably you might strengthen your prediction ability by. They, having two separate PLS models wouldn't be beneficial. Having one multi-block PLS model wouldn't be beneficial. Sorry, yeah. Um, can you um, can you find the correlation between these X variables and then your Y? Choose the ones that have the high correlation and just use those in the monitoring. So you lose the yeah. have the smaller space. Yeah, there's a paper. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll, I can find an email you that's on using multi-block monitoring as a way for variable selection. You group your variables into, into categories and, and uh, you can find the blocks that have strong weights to the Y. We're kind of getting ahead of ourselves. We talked about multiple PLS now, but uh, and use that as a, as a, as a way for variable selection. Okay, uh, so let's uh, just before we move on to multiple PLS, just one, uh, just to recap here. What are the sort of things that can go into each block? Raw materials, we can have one block for raw material. We've spoken about using spectral data in the blocks. We're going to look at at the end of the class today as unfolded batch trajectories within a block. You could go calculate the features as we showed last week and put those extracted features within in blocks. Uh, we've spoken about sequential operations. So um, here in a petroleum refinery, there's, there's multiple units and then they get followed sequentially by another group of units and then maybe a, a final group. The only problem that's really tough in this particular case is getting your rows to be consistent because in a big refinery, it's not easy to track the material that's going through unit one over here. There's some latency before it gets to, to unit two in time. So there's some time delay before it gets to unit two. So if you want to do a multi-block analysis, you need to know what that latency is so you can ensure your rows within those multi-blocks are consistent. So, so that's really tough to get right sometimes. Um, we've spoken about the cases of the judges. And then the final interesting case is if you've got lagged variables in your model. One thing that uh, I've seen happen, some people do, is they take a variable and all its corresponding lags, and then they put that in a single block. So one block is a single variable and all its subsequent lags. 
Another approach is to take all your variables and keep them in one block, and then you lag all those variables by one lag, and put all those single lags in your second block. So that each block will have the same number of columns, because these are all your variables at time whatever, then these are all the variables lag one time unit, these are all the variables lag two time units, and so on. So two different approaches um, could potentially be used over there. Okay, so multi-block PLS, I'm going to just look at this conceptually. We're not going to go through all the arrow diagrams for multi-block PLS. It's very similar. Uh, but what, what does, what the approach that we follow here, uh, you can follow along here on the text. But we'll start with the super level. So at the super level, we have our Y, our single Y matrix. And we extract from that, that Y block a single column and we use that as our initial guess for U. Then we go and take that U vector and we go and perform a consensus PCA cycle. So the usual consensus PCA cycle now through our X blocks. So remember, if we come back and look at consensus PCA, we started off CPCA with a score, TA, that we chose as coming from any of our X blocks. With multi-block PLS, we perform the same idea. We cycle through all our block one, two, three, up to block capital B, but we regress the variables in those blocks one, two, U, A. And once we've done those regressions, we assemble the block scores TA from each block into this super score. So same idea, just copy and paste your scores down from each block into the super level. Then we do a single NEPEL cycle for PLS between the T and the Y. Okay. So we just do, we've assembled this super score matrix. What we'll go do is a single PLS cycle where we regress, let's see, you regress your rows. Okay, yeah, we want TA. You regress your columns from T onto U and get the corresponding weights. Then regress your rows from T onto your weights to get your scores. Regress your columns from T onto your scores to get, your, uh, sorry, regress your Ys onto those, that super score to get your Cs, and then regress your Cs onto the rows from Y to get your Us. <laughs> Bit messy, but it's the ordinary PLS algorithm treating this as your X matrix in PLS and that's an your Y matrix in PLS. So it's an ordinary NEPELs round through the super scores onto the Y. Okay, just changing the, the notation. And that will get our super scores, our super weights, our, our, our Y space loading C, and our, we'll, we'll end up back with our UAs. And then we repeat through that. U A until convergence. Okay. So that's why I didn't do the arrow diagram because it's really just a whole lot of arrows. And uh, again, it's something that you can go read in the literature or, or follow along in these notes. But what, what I do want to just talk a bit about is this step of deflation. Uh, what do we deflate from, from there? And then finally, uh, once we've deflated and we've calculated all our components, we can calculate our predicted Y hats in the usual way by saying Y is TC transpose. Except for our T's, we use our super, our super scores. Okay, so when it comes to deflation in multi-block PLS, you'll see a lot of the discussion in the literature focuses on this particular issue. There's two choices. We can either deflate it from X using our block scores and block loadings, or we can deflate using the super scores, TA super score S, and the block loadings. So both cases use the block loadings, but the difference comes from either using the block score or the super score. If we use the block scores, this is the same idea as in PLS and PCA. You're deflating the block based on its own information. This will ensure that the scores are orthogonal from one component to the next. But what will happen in this particular case is super scores are not orthogonal. If we deflate using our super scores, our super scores will be orthogonal, but the block scores won't be. Okay, so it's, it's just a trade-off. Either we want orthogonality in our scores over here at the super level, or we want orthogonality at, at the block level. 
I tend to go for the second option because what happens is the second method we can then solve using ordinary PLS, using the same uh, crypt, uh, Westinghouse Crypto and McGregor shown in that paper from 98, that multi-block PLS can just be done by using ordinary PLS. Again, we follow the same approach. We assemble our X matrix with careful uh, scaling after pro pre-processing. So ordinary centering and scaling over here for each block. But then once you've done that, you divide each block through by the square root of the number of variables in the block. Calculate PLS in the usual way. And what's, what's, uh, what's interesting in their paper is the, how they prove that those scores from PLS, T1, T2, those are the same as your super scores. We back calculate block weights, block loadings, and block scores, block SPE, block T squared in the usual way um, by following those arrow diagrams. And the results are identical to the full approach. So there's no need to go through all the arrows using that, that approach. So, so that's if we follow this concept here. The reason why we, we follow this deflation so if we can use that quick approach from, uh, from Westerhouse is because the Westerhouse approach says our super scores are going to be the PLS scores. And we know our PLS scores are orthogonal. And so what the Westerhouse approach essentially is saying is that when we, when we follow that shortcut, we're, we're deflating each block by the super score. Okay, and then one final thing, okay, is is asking whether all of this complexity is worth it, right? Um, the, Niall's question was quite good, asking them whether separate monitoring models would be would be better, or what is the advantage of the multi-block case? For multi-block PCA, there's probably not too much advantage to uh, multi-block PCA for, for monitoring. There's, there is definitely an advantage for model interpretation, though. But the biggest case where multi-block has an advantage is for some of the um, some of the predictive modeling. If you don't if you if you do, if you don't deflate according to this approach, let's see over here. If you follow this deflation, you'll probably get slightly worse um, performance from PLS. But if you follow this deflation, what's interesting is the paper from Westerhaus shows that in fact. Multi-block PLS, because it's calculated from ordinary PLS, there's a, this is the important implication, is that your predictive performance from multi-block PLS will be the same as ordinary PLS. So again, it seems like I'm keeping, I'm going at this, like why we're looking at multi-block if it's so much harder from a conceptual point of view, but also this paper by by this shows that multi-block PLS doesn't really get any better performance. We're not going to get better predictions from a multi-block PLS. But what we do find is that those models are easier to interpret, and from a monitoring point of view, monitoring with PLS, I would say, you can get better fault detection for that. And Dr. McGregor showed in that paper at AICG that the fault detection is often faster. You'll often pick up your faults earlier than if you had used a separate um, PLS model. Okay, so so that is that's the one one advantage over there. And the other advantage, I guess you can see, is when we're looking now in the next section for batch data analysis, we're going to automatically land up with a multi-block system. So we need to understand how multi-block methods handle handle the data over there. Okay. So. discuss this quick and this FMC example I'm going to come back to this at the end we're going to look at alignment the features and multi-block PLS on the single case study at the end so I'll leave that for later and then I'll, I'll wrap up the section on multi-block monitoring just by going through these next two slides one one problem is as, as we've said the contribution plots from a single PCA or a single PLS they often show up a lot of variables. Um, I, I really wish I could show some of the slides of internal um, models I've built for the company I work at. And, and sometimes the contribution plots are really tough to interpret because of the 100 variables, 
there's about 20 or 30 that show up. And it's not, it's not feasible to ask operators or other people to go investigate all of those. So uh, similar to the case where I just described for the polyester extrusion, what happens is if we divide that complex system into smaller groups, we can go get a contribution plot for each one of those groups. So for example, in that extruder, there's a melt zone, there's an extrusion zone, there's a casting zone, and there's where you actually roll up the extruded product and the tensions and the, in, the, in, that, um, in that product that are measured. So you, is it, is, am I getting a high SP in, is there some imbalance in the forces in my rolling unit to roll up that fiber? Or is it when I'm casting it, or is it where I'm extruding it or melting it? So you can really isolate quite carefully where the problem is. In a petrochemical plant, you could look at taking even a single unit operation, like a distillation column, and divide it into the bottoms, the tops, the feed, the uh, reboiler section, the condenser. And we monitor the SPs for each of those regions, as well as the super level SP and T squared. And only the, the contributions are only shown for the region where we see the limits going out of control. Another really nice way of using multi-block modeling is with this sort of staged approach or sequential processes. So many companies work on uh, sequential base for, for the material. So they'll get their raw materials and you can do an SPE just on, a, so you build your monitoring model so that your raw materials are in a single block. And those raw materials are going to be used in subsequent processes. So what one can do is you use your, your data just on your raw materials and you leave your data in block two, three, four, and so on as missing. Like you haven't processed those materials just yet. But you take those raw materials, put them into your multi-block monitoring model, and check the SPE just on that first block. If the SPE shows it's below the limit, it's indicating that those raw materials are consistent with previous good raw materials. So you've got a good indicator that it's safe to proceed to the next stage, which might be, um, say, a batch system where those raw materials are then used. So block two is a batch reactor, and we perform um, those. Once that batch has taken place and, and finished up, we get all the trajectory information, and that goes into our second block. Check the SPE on the second block. If that's below the limit, we can say it's now safe to send the material from that batch to, let's say, the next stage, which might be packaging. While the packaging is progressing, you, you notice that you're getting alarms showing up. Your SPE is going out of control. So it's indicating that before you send those materials to your fourth stage, well, hang on, something's gone wrong in this particular third stage. Let's go investigate the SPE contributions in that third stage and see what it is. Is it something that we can still rescue or fix up before we go ahead to the fourth stage? If the problem here is so bad, we, we might as well stop early and not proceed to the fourth stage and spend money on, on that final, final step. Or it might be that we've got some data here, previous bad observations, which show that SPE problem in stage three as well, and let, we can go examine those previous observations. Did those observations show success after the fourth stage? In other words, is the fourth stage capable of undoing the problem in the third stage? That's not always possible, um, but if you've got historical data to show that, that will help you with your decision here after stage three, do I go into stage four? Or do I just cut my losses early and not go to stage four and save some money. The reason when uh, this becomes very useful is I've seen examples in companies where this has been two weeks, this is my own experience even with the case where it's been two weeks delay from beginning to end. I know other cases where that duration is in the order of months. So if you can tell early on that it's not going to be successful here at the end, you don't have to wait for all that time to elapse. You can just scrap those materials and then start over again with the next batch of materials. Okay. So taking the stage-wise approach in a multi-block system can be extremely helpful. You're basically saying, I'm going to use information from previous stages and cascade that down 
to keep checking my subsequent stages. Any questions on that? Okay, so let's uh, let's just take another break again. I think. Uh,